Most people don't know what a dead man's trigger is. And even fewer need one. A dead man's trigger is a safety valve. For reasons of security, a person prepares a recourse of such severe action that if harmed, they will release a cache of damaging evidence against those enemies. Given his situation, Dr. Stephen Greer is one of those rare men. Why would he need one? He's not the first person to push the disclosure of a corrupt military industrial agenda. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. In his final public speech, a farewell address, no less. In a time when every second on TV was priceless, United States President Dwight D. Eisenhower decided not to brag about his victory in the Korean War. Instead, he cashed in all his chips to warn this nation of a hidden enemy. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. When I was with Lawrence Rockefeller at his ranch in 1993, he turned to me and he said, the implications of this are so vast and so profound that no aspect of life on Earth will be unchanged by its disclosure. I said, yes, Lawrence, that's why it's been kept secret. It's not because it's trivial. It's because the implications are so profound. So there have been attempts to bring this information out for over 60 years. And here we sit in 2012 with the world still burning oil and gas and coal when we have had technologies, sciences, and all the information we need to have had a completely new civilization. What Eisenhower warned us about over 60 years ago, according to Steve Greer, has long become truth in Washington, D.C. And why is Washington, D.C. booming? Because the rest of the country is sending their money here. I know, isn't it beautiful through the trees? My name is Ted Loader. Uh, I've been working with CSETI program and Dr. Greer for 15 years. Cool, huh? <laughs> oh. Yeah. What, one always wonders if the, if the public really knew what was going on with the government covert programs and how much money has been put into it, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, I think the public would be a little annoyed. Thomas Jefferson believed all men have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The government they formed would serve to secure those rights. But when corporations or other specialized groups of men become more powerful than those who govern, our security is at stake. Thomas Jefferson um, wrote about unchecked power of the corporation being a threat to the democracy and the banks. And the, and the banks. You see, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank issues every dollar bill, yet it is not run by the U.S. government or any elected official. It is owned by a private banking cartel. But here I find the chairman of the Federal Reserve who's in charge of the dollar, in charge of the money, in charge of what the money supply is going to be, 
the middle class is being wiped out and nobody's understanding that it has to do with the value of money prices are going up so how are you able to defend this policy of deliberate depreciation of our money part a lot of it depends on what happens to the price of oil the four horsemen or families of banking who own and run the federal reserve also run the four largest oil companies oil is also used to make and run machinery and current mechanical technology of course there's one industry that needs these more than anyone else the military industrial complex you begin to get into this uh, very scary scenario that has to do with the human condition of the proclivity to accumulate vast amounts of power around a handful of people. All right, sit down and shut up. And right now, these misanthropic sociopaths are running the planet into the ground. When, when uh, Congress or whatever else, or budget directors say, well, the the we, you know we've lost a hundred billion dollars in black program what does the public do what can the public do we can complain to our congressmen but our congressmen can't get any information with lobbyists interest groups campaign funding the economic powers that be have learned to control the political sphere these politicians become almost like placeholders and they don't realize that until they get into the White House or into the Senate Intelligence Committee. It doesn't matter who the president is. They're gonna do what they wanna do. And that which is good for them isn't always good for everybody else. From 1945 to 1998, 2,053 nuclear bombs exploded on this planet. The United States detonated over half of them. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. When the first nuclear bomb was exploded in Trinity, Robert Oppenheimer, one of the founding fathers of the nuclear age, said, we have done this before. It could have been that Oppenheimer was speaking about weapons described in the ancient Sanskrit texts like the Mahabharata. In which they refer to a bolt of iron charged with the light of a thousand suns. This bolt of iron was hurled in anger and led to an explosive event which is very graphically described in this religious scripture specifically showing all the key indications of radiation sickness and the various problems with nuclear weaponry that we've come to expect. When we started detonating thermonuclear weapons, atomic weapons, and developing these sort of destructive technologies, the civilizations that have been watching this planet for millennia said, oh my God, these people are going way off the reservation. They are now an existential threat to themselves, but also to other planets, potentially. All over the world, we see very conclusive evidence that ancient people were in contact with extraterrestrial life. The Japanese said that their civilization was given to them by a people they called the Dogu, who came from what they described as Anemono Toribune, which translates as bird boat universe, meaning flying boats from the universe. The ancient Sanskrit writings of India have elaborate descriptions of vimanas or flying craft. These texts are thousands of years old. They predate any conception that we have of spacecraft or aircraft. But evidence is not just found in ancient texts. It is also captured in our ancestors' art, as if it was plainly obvious that ET vehicles appeared in ancient skies. It is a foregone conclusion by most broad-minded people 
that we are not alone in this universe. The question is, how close are they? And we all looked up at once. It was almost like an intelligence told us, hey, look over here, we're here. I saw three red lights in a triangle almost directly overhead. I saw these things and I ran inside and got my brothers and sisters. It actually lifted up and it could actually turn. I'm gonna ask you to look away. I wasn't one who believed that UFOs might exist. I was satisfied they exist. The life I have isn't what I'd seen. They estimated 100 yards from the left wing the was this 100 blue, foot disc. A lot of the astronauts are told to keep it quiet, and they're good Americans, too. They develop the film from the moon, everything that's done by NASA. No! There's so much evidence out there that even if less than 1% is true, that would be enough to collapse the current paradigm and change the whole planet. This is our signature tones that we broadcast over our small walkie-talkie. They were recorded in the crop circle. What happens is the extraterrestrials, they come into the area where we, we vector them in with the signature tones that we broadcast, then it enables them to home in and get a, a real good fix on where the site is where we're all, while we're setting up. The whole uh, concepts of the crossing point of light, the physics of consciousness and interstellar communication, all were developed on a kind of a vision quest we did here in 95 or 96. Astronomer J. Allen Hynek developed a scale to identify the types of human ET encounters. From his original three categories, a fourth, more controversial, has been added, CE4. Even more controversial, Stephen Greer added a fifth kind of encounter, CE5, human-initiated contact. So, how is this done? Given Schrodinger's idea that the number of all minds in the universe is one, in order to make this type of contact, a human could potentially access that single inner consciousness through intense meditation and then visualize his location down through the Milky Way to the planet Earth to wherever he sits under the stars. In theory, then, any extraterrestrial passing by would be able to hear the broadcast and know exactly where to go if they choose to do so. It's interesting how many people have never been uh out in a place like this where they can see the whole Milky Way galaxy. Most people who come for a week, it, it alters their life. There's meditation techniques, there's remote viewing techniques, and once you start learning these processes and refining them, then you can make contact more quickly, more easily, and be more of an asset to the group. Checking to be sure that there's no source from anyone else so that when we do start having electromagnetic signals through this, we know that it's a legitimate source. My name's Emery Smith. Uh, I've been with CSETI for approximately three years. Getting the baseline reading 
from us? My duties consist of a couple things. I am uh, Dr. Greer's head security detail. Uh, I also am their photographer. I operate anywhere from two to six cameras at one time. Yeah, that's our craft. It was over the mountains in this direction. Many of the craft that are coming in are transdimensional and the way I understand it, not visible to the human eye. And that's where this new technology, the uh, night vision, that's where that's coming into play. And With the advent of new technology that's out there, it becomes easier and easier for us to capture these beings and these celestial objects on film. After you do the night vision, it has that green hue, of course. And after a while, when you get back to real life, you're thinking, why isn't everything green? This can't be reality. I want to show an early one from Gulf Breeze from 1992. We went down there. And one of the fun things that happened is that I had about 40, 50 people. Let's go out on the beach. And we didn't have good cameras then. But you'll get the feeling of how exciting it was to have all these people. And one, and then two, and then three, and then four ET craft materialized right in the sky. There it goes. One, two, three. Yeah. And there's four. There's four. There's four. We have a confirmed CE5. Holy damn hot shit. <laughs> hot dog. Thank you. All right. So the point, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> It's your responsibility to uh, go into meditation, find a little bit of time, 10, 15 minutes, and remote view who's up there and how many. I can attest to the fact that real phenomenon happens here. I really feel that his CE5 protocols are based on a, a spiritual kind of positive contact, and I think that uh, that is an excellent model for any kind of communication, whether it be on Earth, uh, in the United Nations, or wherever, but in this particular field, it's with cosmic cultures. And we use consciousness, uh, meditation, visualization, remote viewing, certain tones, and we do it in a group when we can, or even as individuals. It's just, it's just been this series of unbelievable events that are amplified by, by our meditation. It uh, enforces this communication between us and the ETs, and it's, it's so interactive. Um, I can feel everything, I can hear all the sounds just right there. Perfect. And then this being the, the little larval one comes up and, and I kind of, we had this hug and I shared the joy and I'm like just thanking it for this experience. And let's, do, let's do what we can to feel as if it would feel that this is perfectly normal and natural. Oh, sure. And that, you know, this is... Relax calm. and get in that flow of consciousness, exactly. So I, I was jarred by our group getting like tripped out and in that kind of... Like, it, I was startled by some of the ways that our group were, was being, and I was going, and then there was moments where I was like, wow, I can only imagine how oh, yeah. a visitor might feel. The ETs pick up on your intentions, and if you're really out there just to learn and really want to communicate with these extraterrestrials, well, it's going to happen. Avahanam Narayanam Padma Bhavam Vashishtam Shaktin chatat putra parasharam cha Yasam shukam golda param mahantam Govinda yogindra matashashisha And we ask these extraterrestrial civilizations to join us as they begin to learn of us, to help us, and to understand us, even as we endeavor to understand them and welcome them here to this beautiful planet. Oh my God, another beautiful, stunning, absolutely stunning. Oh, 
becomes a military plane very quick. Yeah, there's a very fast military. Okay, they're gonna go. Oh. It turned right to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, my heart literally sunk when, when the when the jet when the, when the jet you know got to where where the craft had to had to phase out. Yeah. And like to, to feel all that love build, and then to feel that jet coming in, and it was like you, on, on a heart level, you, I, my heart literally sunk when, yeah. uh, when the jet crossed the path where it had to take off. What you got, you got like this light traveling, 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 and you can see it's not like a satellite where it's like got like a path, it's got like a you know, like a movement, yeah, and then it's gone. When I was 17, um, I uh, injured myself, I got so infected. And at the time, because I was very poor and I didn't have any health care, I just laid there and I got sicker and sicker and sicker and I had a near-death experience. I found myself out in deep space and it was this experience of complete oneness with the cosmos, not just with Earth and life on Earth, but with the stars and the infinity of creation. Uh, it, it certainly altered the course of what I would end up doing because I then learned meditation. I actually became very aware of the power of the mind. This experience helped guide the direction of his life. Though Greer went on to earn a medical degree and raise a family, he continued to study consciousness and contact. And decades later, it seems he would be the doctor called upon first to examine a very unusual body. This came to us in the last couple of years, and there's a man who runs an institute in another country that I cannot talk about. But he came into possession of a little creature. It is humanoid. It does not look human. We have acquired an EBE, an extraterrestrial biological entity. We're flying over to Europe soon to uh, take some tissue samples and do some uh, DNA testing. This was found in the Atacama Desert. We don't know how it came about. Here's the great view of the face and cheekbone, very complex. Now there is a fracture here and behind this right ear is caved in and that's how, how this, this, this ET beam was killed. We have the best scientists in the U.S. from Stanford that are going to be doing the testing itself to see what this really is and also to rule out what it's not. The uh, initial reaction that I had is the same reaction that many of my colleagues here at Stanford and elsewhere have had when I've shown them is that, wow, what is this? The question is important enough in at least two ways. Uh, the primary reason is that there's a lot of claims about specimens and claims about uh, uh, aliens. And of course there's a lot of ridicule associated with that. So one of the best things that we should be doing, of course, then is bringing the best scientific techniques to bear. The techniques are available, the techniques are cheap, the answers are nearly absolute, so let's do it. It's so exciting because it's not just... In setting up for this, uh, I'm going to be giving Steve uh, not only the tubes that this should be going into, but I'm also going to be sending across the microscope that I feel they should be using to do the analysis with. Before we even get started with some of the analysis, I think it's going to be important to rule out some of the obvious critiques that could come up. And one of those critiques is that this is a syndrome or a mutation. This is a bone dysplasia. And luckily, uh, here at Stanford, we happen to have literally the world's expert, the man who wrote the book on bone dysplasias and syndromes, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Ralph Lachman, 
who uh, has kindly agreed to look at the specimen, uh, both the pictures as well as the CT scans and the x-rays, uh, to help determine whether or not it's anything that he's ever seen before. I think that a dozen or even 15 years ago, answering the question of what is this would really not have been possible because the kinds of technologies were not available as are available today. But really the DNA tells the story. And because we have the computational techniques, that allows us to determine in very short order whether in fact uh, this is human. So this will be basically uh, an absolute level of proof as to what this actually is. The problem is not proving that UFOs exist. It's when you begin to expose the energy and propulsion systems behind how they're getting here. You're talking about unveiling an entirely new science that would replace oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, public utilities. And this is the $600 trillion problem. So as a patent office, after they fired me, mm -hmm. I had to wait six years before I got rehired. Everybody at the office was avoiding the case. But when they finally did, the arbitrator wrote an 85-page 80, um, report on how the media had caused my dismissal. So I only got a 30-day suspension out of the whole thing, <laughs> which what? was taken out of the what? tiny little bit of six-year back pay. So that was great. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah, it made it all wonderful. worth it, so to speak, because that's how we were able to open the offices and stuff. It was very comfortable. No feeling of being shocked or anything else, just a, you know, a good feeling, comfortable. What scientists need to do and normal people need to do is they need to look at the hardcore evidence, decide that, oh my gosh, ETs are real, and then get over that. And if that's the case, then you can start extrapolating yeah. because they're getting here, which means they have solved the physics problem, if you will. That's an actual photograph that uh, Mark Whitford took, a friend of mine. And you see the stars in the background. Mm -hmm. So this is a fixed camera. Mm -hmm. The craft was a triangular craft moving away from him, and all of a sudden it makes a right angle turn. Apparently it has what I would describe as inertial shielding. It's the only way something can make a right angle turn without having everybody killed inside of the craft. Though we experience inertial forces every day, their origins remain a mystery. However, there are theories that point to interactions between objects with mass and a quantum energy field. Inertia is due to zero-point energy interaction. So you're interacting with a charged matrix, which is a zero-point field. If you try to change that, then you get a reaction force. There must be an interference shield of electromagnetic nature that would stop that interaction with the zero-point field. And you can suspect that UFOs have already figured this out, because they wouldn't be flying around and still have inhabitants. New energy scientists today are attempting to find new ways to define the relationship between electricity, gravity, magnetism, and propulsion. But as history has shown, change does not always come easy. It's like Newton's. Why is that apple falling? Nobody ever asked that question before or even tried to come up with an answer. And Newton comes up with something called Newton Bucket or Newton's problem, the only guy that solves it 300 years later is Einstein. So, you know, how smart can we be? <laughs> if you look at everything normal within the conventional wisdom, you're not going to learn anything new. My name is Morgan Boardman. I am the Chief Financial Officer of uh, Morningstar Applied Physics. Uh, my business partners are Paul Murad and uh, Dr. John Brandenburg. What we're doing, like I said earlier, is we're using a, a magnet, magnetic field that's rotating about the axis with the hope of generating a magnetic vortex. In essence, we are trying to start a civilian uh, advanced research projects agency. Okay, all right, so basically uh, we have four options. Option one is um, a retarded potential. Uh, yeah. Option two is a lagging image, right? Yeah. 
Option three is pointing vector as a motive uh, for propulsion, or how that may be what's happening, right? Yeah. And that's actually taking um, uh, angular momentum and changing it into linear momentum if it's working the way we want it to, right? Yeah. Okay. And then the fourth yeah. one. The fourth one is um, that we are uh, somehow either generating and or absorbing uh, gravity waves. Do we accept Einstein's viewpoint that thou shall not go faster than the speed of light? If you look at a black hole, the comment is that gravity is so strong that nothing leaves. But it does have something that leaves the black hole, and that is gravity. So does that imply that Gravity moves faster than the speed of light? Could be. Gravity is another one of those seemingly self-evident forces that has raised a number of questions. How does it really work? How can we use it to our advantage? In the mid-1920s, T. Townsend Brown discovered that electric charge and gravitational mass are coupled, and that by building devices that harness these interactive forces, we could create advanced propulsion. At about the same time, Nikolai Tesla and Thomas Edison won the Nobel Prize in physics, but both refused it. Tesla was at the end of a long career of inventing. He had advanced technology in the fields of X-ray, radio waves, internal combustion, and, of course, atmospheric electricity. When everything was said and done, he had earned 112 U.S. patents. He proved that electricity can travel wirelessly in the air and ultimately died penniless. However, his work did influence many others, most notably Lester Hendershot and Dr. T. Henry Moray. Hendershot invented a magnetronic generator to energize an impossible flight if fueled by gas that took Charles Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis from New York to Paris. Dr. T. Henry Moray developed the Moray valve a device for extracting radiant energy from the zero-point field and demonstrated this device hundreds of times and had dozens of signed affidavits supporting his science. Yet in the end, even these two notable scientists were ignored and bullied. Dr. Moray's device was hammered down and broken into pieces by a competitor, and before he could finish reconstruction, he passed away of natural causes. Hendershot fled to Mexico to continue work, but was found dead at 61 years of age, attributed to suicide. There's a, all kinds of skullduggery that happened there. I don't think T. Henry Morey ever got a decent chance to ever do anything with that. There is absolutely no question that T. Henry Morey had uh, a system that produced 50, uh, about 50 kilowatts out of a 55-pound box. The conventional electrodynamics model does not allow this to happen. In other words, it doesn't allow you to extract excess energy from the vacuum and use that to power your load. It costs just as much to restore it as was used to destroy it. So we got to put in more than we can ever get out in a load with such a squirrely circuit. And that's the only kind of circuit we've used in power systems since day one. We're still building them. We're still making power systems that deliberately kill them. So we pay the power company to have a giant wrestling match inside his generator and lose. In the 1950s, there were some very provocative articles saying that, oh, electrogravitics is the best thing since sliced bread, how all the aviation companies are now backing electrogravitics, they're all doing experiments on it. Well, within a couple of years, there was no news at all. Once they figured out that they could really control gravity, 1954, it all went black. I think the boys in the Black Projects have solved that problem because it sure sounds like it from what the witnesses have told me. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Sorry, but I can't, can't even think about it. I see so many things in my life, it's just hard to say. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. What Stan shared with me was interesting. Uh, in order to run this uh, engine off of uh, water, We've also had to learn the ability to adjust the burn rate of hydrogen to co-equal the fossil fuels. So he plans for a patent, and then he gets a call from actually a visitation by two guys from the Pentagon. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Meyer's invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. But he asked that this become a public uh, patent so that the civilians could benefit from it. 
And he indicated that if we don't do that, overseas people will. In 1996, Meyer was sued by his investors, who claimed the device was not revolutionary, despite verification of the unique voltage intensifier circuit by the US Patent Office. Meyer was brought to trial, but key evidence was not allowed. His oral testimony was not even recorded due to an audio recorder malfunction, and the judge recessed early for vacation. Later, Meyer made an appeal but was denied. He was found guilty of fraud and ordered to repay his investors, putting an immediate dent on the idea of funding new technology. On March 20th, 1998, Stanley joined his brother and two NATO officials for a dinner meeting. Stan took a sip of cranberry juice, grabbed his neck, ran out of the restaurant, and fell to the ground, saying, they poisoned me. Uh, he, he fell down after eating at a, uh, a restaurant nearby where he lived, fell down the parking lot, said, I've been poisoned, collapsed. And that's on the police report? Yeah. The police report confirms his words. The cause of death was written to be an aneurysm. Though he left behind just enough materials for others to piece together his process, the full secrets of his device died with him. So from this, I began to do more work with the administration, various people, friends of the president, um, the Rockefeller family, the Lawrence was the white hat in that crowd who wanted us to bring this information out, actually hosted us at the Rockefeller Ranch in the Tetons. And one night he pulled me out on the, on the deck and he said, well, you know, we really need you to do this. I said, Lawrence, you're old, you're rich, and you're Rockefeller. What do you want me to do? I'm just a country doctor banging around in an ER in North Carolina. He says, no, no, we want you to do this. I went, okay. So I'm the throwaway guy. I'm the guy you can throw away because my life doesn't matter. We are back in Rachel, Nevada with our first two distinguished guests. Stephen Greer is a North Carolina doctor. He does a lot more than watch the skies. He fires off messages, and he says that someone or something is responding. Dr. Greer is looking for close encounters of the fifth kind. What, to, at this minute, do you believe? Our assessment at this point is that there is at least one extraterrestrial civilization which has managed to make its way to our corner of the universe. And number two, that there's no uh, evidence at all that they have hostile intentions towards this planet. And number three, that the priority at this point must be trying to establish uh, some sort of a liaison to them, some sort of a, a diplomatic liaison to them, and that's what we're working on. Is there a continued cover-up? Yes. Do those at the highest levels of government agencies know that there's a government? Not necessarily. Officer X, a high-ranking military veteran, joined forces with Dr. Greer in order to use his military and government influence to gain access to high-level officials. Uh, I was able to arrange for uh, C-SETI briefing to the uh, then Vice Director for Intelligence for the Joint Staff, uh, Admiral Tom Wilson, the same person who had been at the line of command with me. Uh, at that meeting was uh, Steve, Apollo 14 astronaut Ed Mitchell, Brigadier General, uh, retired Steve Lovkin, Sherry uh, uh, Mike, uh, Steve's uh, right arm. Well, Dr. Greer did indeed uh, mount an, uh, an initiative and did go to to Washington, did speak with uh, high-level government people. I attended and helped him with that. We briefed uh, certain members of Congress, some of their staff, some of the people from the White House. We talked with people in the Pentagon. It, it led me to the belief that people in high-level government have very, very little, if any, information, valid information. One of the most important of all the meetings was with CIA Director R. James Woolsey. Here I fly up to Washington. The cover story was a dinner party. One of the things that I found was that uh, this CIA director wasn't lying when he communicated to us that he had not had access to these projects. He was shaken to his core. 
We met for not 20 minutes, almost three hours. And by the end of it, I handed him, my hands were shaking, <laughs> I handed him this document. And it was a position paper recommending executive orders and the things the Clinton administration and he needed to do to get control of this mess. And he looked at it and he looked at me. He says, yes, he says, but how do we disclose that which we have no access to? And I almost wept. I went, what? Dr. Greer approached many DC officials in an attempt to gain an audience. One of the people who took him seriously was former CIA director Bill Colby. True, if there's truth in it, there can be a danger in that situation. We've seen that happen in other cases. I said, you have to consider the possibility of some danger to not only your reputation, but to your person. I mean, there are, people do react rather violently to some kinds of charges, or particularly if they're true. Now, you know, I'm a 30-some-year-old doctor with four kids, a golden retriever, and a house in, in North Carolina. So I'm going, this is down the rabbit hole fast. But that is the situation, my friends, when you're dealing with secrecy that is criminal and illegal. In 1997, in an effort to push his message deeper into Congress and the White House, Greer headed to Phoenix to prepare a video with his best evidence to show in Washington, D.C. While he was in the editing room, the biggest UFO witnessed event in history was about to happen. On March 13th, 1997, when the hale Bob Comet was very clear in the south northwest sky, thousands of people were outside trying to get a glimpse of it when they also caught a glimpse of these orbs, giant orbs, equidistant in a V formation of a mile to two mile wide in some very credible reports. And that's the particular area where these phenomena keep popping up from my vantage point. The Native Americans living in the basin between South Mountain and the Estrellas have told me that not only were they looking up at the Phoenix Lights during the mass sighting, but they've been looking up at them for centuries. I live in a community called Loop, northeast of Flagstaff, on the Navajo Indian Reservation. We'll have to go back uh, in time one day before. We saw uh, six to seven lights that were circling along the horizon. The entire street came out. It was almost like a, a block party. Everybody turned off their lights. Everybody sat in their front yards. And everybody watched this uh, unusual light show. I squeezed down the best of what I found and finally came forward in 2004 with the Phoenix Lights, a skeptic's discovery that we are not alone. 10,000 people approximately witnessed this, one of the largest uh, experiences of this sort ever recorded. The Phoenix Lights phenomenon didn't seem to be falsifiable in any way. It was being validated by most everybody that saw it. The ultimate, um, shall we say, um, insult was the governor of the state of Arizona, Fife Symington, finally calling a news conference, saying that he has finally got the answer to the Phoenix Lights, and he introduces some staff member dressed up as a space alien. People got very angry, because here is the top elected official of the state making fun of what I estimate to be close to probably 10,000 people saw this. Under the watchful eye of the public, Symington retracted his statement. If you had been here 10 years ago and standing out here and looking up there at the, um, at the lights and the view, um, you would have been astounded. You would have been amazed. The so-called Phoenix lights were seen by many people in 1997. Skeptics say they were military aircraft or flares, but not the former governor. It was probably uh, some form of an alien spacecraft. Barcelona. 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 To retrieve the 
the evidence. Dr. Bravo. Hi, baby. Are you ready for the trip? I'm ready for the trip. I'm so excited. Okay. We're going to do some very wonderful work, and I can't wait to get the results. Upon arriving in uh, Spain to uh, look at the being for the very first time, I was kind of skeptical. It was definitely a game changer for my thought process to actually see it in person than to see it on film. Uh, the first thing we had to do was go to the radiology lab because we needed x-rays and CAT scans before we did anything. The head radiologist at the center um, saw the beam and was quite impressed. And the first thing she said was, wow, that looks like an alien. And when the CAT scan images started coming up on the computer, it was just profound. And I saw inside the bone, and I saw, you know, organs and lung material, brain material. I knew that this was not a hoax, it was not fake, that this was actually some sort of living creature. Right, well if somebody made it, they have a future in microsurgery uh, because they were smart enough then to put in these millimeter wide bone uh, holes where the uh, arteries go in to uh, feed the bone marrow. And so now the challenge is to prove what it is, right? My interest, frankly, is to disprove that it's anything unusual or anything paranormal. I would like to prove that this is human. I would like to prove that this is just an interesting mutation. But obviously, if you leave your mind open, or I should say, if you leave your mind closed to alternatives, you'll never see what those alternatives might actually be. In every situation with scientists, your reputation's at stake. You know, I have every expectation that even doing this is going to lead to some ribbing from some of my colleagues, right? But I think that that's perfectly acceptable because at the end of the day, who's going to validate these things? If someone isn't willing to step forward and do it right, then you're going to have it sitting out there forever hanging in limbo, right? I mean, if you let other people and their opinions stop you from believing what you know to be true, then all you're doing is stopping the possibility of progress. Anytime anybody tries to study this subject seriously, we're subject to ridicule. I'm a full professor at a, at a relatively major university, and I'm certain that my colleagues at the university laugh at me and, and hoot and holler behind my back when they hear that I have an interest in studying unidentified flying objects. There's really a subtle kind of suppression at play here. You don't worry about what um, the CEO of Enron thinks about what you say. You worry about what your friends think. You worry about what your parents would think if you posted whatever you care about on Facebook or something. We take the risk to appear to be a crackpot. There may be people who are going to be threatened by that for any number of reasons. My feeling was that I was involved in a lot of strange activities, so I tried to say to myself, let's not look at this with too much exposure and mention it because as a question of credibility. This should be the subject of rigorous scientific investigation and not the subject of rubbishing by tabloid newspapers. MUFON is the Mutual UFO Network, and it was founded in 1969 by Walt Andrus. And our uh, mission statement is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. MUFON is the, is the world's largest UFO investigative organization. We have approximately 3,000 members worldwide. Um, approximately 500 of those uh, have their PhDs. Uh, these are people who really would like to delve deep into the UFO phenomenon and try to figure out uh, not only what it is, but how it's happening. Armed with what he thought was some of the best available evidence, including the Phoenix Lights, Steve Greer organized a Project Starlight briefing before several Congress, 
Pentagon and White House staff members. Things seem to be on track for disclosure. Of the the uh, device and the internal, all of it, um, with a lot of, of detail, and this is a cutaway. This was done and escaped government control. Right. Mr. Bentwater's case took 20 some years in England. So this is in our possession and not the Ministry of Defense. So, um, or, or it would never be found. Where it'd be going to a black hole. Right? Yeah. But then the bad news came. Sherry Adamiak, Steve's partner and longtime friend, along with Steve and another team member, were all suddenly diagnosed with a malignant cancer. I've had these experiences since I was a child or a young man, but to articulate them so other people understand them, I need someone with capacity to hear it. She was that person. I mean, this has been, you can't resolve well, it's been very hard for me. Oh, yeah, you know, I you know. Get up I know every day. You know, um, but. one of the last places she wanted to come was here. So she asked that her, her ashes be placed on the land. So we put her ashes around that tree. I don't take anything for granted, frankly. And so each time that I do a presentation uh, or lead a group, I think this may be the last time. The thing that has kept me going the most is not any external thing, but the experience of that near-death experience where I know that there's an aspect of us that doesn't die. That is why I can go mano a mano with these elements and not be afraid. I shouldn't say be afraid, not stand down. Everyone has fear. I've certainly had my fears. Um, but it gives you an anchor so that you can go forward. More than ever, Dr. Greer understood what he had always sensed. It was not the power of a cosmic field or quantum vacuum that would propel us into a new world. It was the mind. This really is the opening to an entirely new science of consciousness. You can maybe think of, of consciousness uh, as a television set. Uh, on the TV screen, you see pictures and sounds and so forth. And if you tried to find out where that was coming from and you looked inside the television, you know, you're not going to find it. It's not there. The signal is in the radio waves around it, invisible to us, that's being interpreted by the television as pictures and sounds. So this is very much like the state of how we understand the mind and consciousness. Dr. John at Princeton uh, proved that putting your awareness on a, a, a device that was a random number generator would affect it. So you have this random number generator and it's producing 50-50 ones and zeros. And then you introduce a person into the picture and you tell them, try to affect it with their mind. Think more ones or more zeros. You measure that and sure enough what they found was that there are more ones or more zeros being produced that correlate to that person's intention. So we can see effects being produced uh, forwards and backwards in time, which is really strange. Uh, distance doesn't seem to matter as much. You can get the same strength of effects if you're right in front of the REG or if you're on the other side of the planet. Consciousness is a non-local field, and it isn't limited to your brain waves and body. Dr. John once had the opportunity to ask the Dalai Lama if he thought the random number generators themselves were conscious and the Dalai Lama thought about it and his reply was that if you think they're conscious then they're conscious. Just like consciousness can have positive effects on the zeitgeist or ether, it can also work the other way.
Um, unfortunately, when you start to deal with inventors who have anomalous results that seem to be over unity, paranoia seems to accompany that process. And John Searle is famous for having a circular magnetic device that has both energy and propulsion built into one unit. And the electric company felt that this guy was stealing money, took him to court, went to jail, his house caught fire, and all of his property and all of his designs burned. The, the concept of freedom, this sort of uh, idea of people having the liberty to pursue happiness and to pursue abundance, this has been completely, uh, in a sense, turned upside down. We actually reprinted a report on the military involvement of the Department of Energy. And it's so extensive, it's the major operation that goes on there. There have been over 5,000 patents that have been sequestered by the national security state, taken out of the public domain. Many of them deal with energy technologies. It's a policy that the military seems to feel is necessary for national security. However, at this point, we often wonder 50 years after World War II and the Cold War, um, whether such uh, sequestering is necessary. Suppression of new technology would be an obvious plague on the idea and strength of a free market system. Yet, it still seems to happen right in front of our eyes. And this is a huge controversy, one of the largest, maybe most intense controversies in the history of science. There's nothing worse, uh, I found, than suggesting to academic physicists in particular, and academics in general, that they are not only wrong, but disastrously wrong, catastrophically wrong. The coal fusion patents have not been approved. They will not get through. American citizens are being denied their constitutional rights. I inadvertently was looking through some piles of paper that had been given to me in a casual manner by all these hot fusion physicists as they were trying to do their calorimetric uh, repeat of the pons fleischmann experiment. And I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It looked like monkey business to me at the time, and it has turned out to be exactly that. It was represented as a negative result when it was positive. And that data is scientific fraud, as far as I'm concerned. It's been referred to legal authorities in the government. I asked for a review at MIT, got nowhere. If this type of manipulation had occurred in any legitimate research area, such as cancer research, AIDS research, global warming research, anything that's accepted as reasonable to be researching, the per people would lose their jobs, they wouldn't be in science. And yet, these people today, their data is used today, to year 2000, and all before, to reject patents. Yes, there, there is serious criminal activity going on that ultimately must be rooted out. It became very clear to me that, you know, you kind of had a tiger by the tail here and that this was serious. For a moment, Dr. Greer considered shutting everything down. He had been threatened and swindled far too many times. Sherry was gone. He had no office, no staff, no money. Back in 1998, I was given information by a friend that Dr. Greer was having a conference. Literally the month that Sherry Adamek passed away, within 30 days, I have this scheduled event. So I went to the conference and learned some things and listened. And so she just on a lark came, and she's an emergency doctor like I am. And what really grabbed my attention was he was getting all this information from military witnesses. That was in 1998. By 2000, when we were planning and storyboarding and working the whole disclosure project event out and pulling together all these hundreds of witnesses, um, we uh, didn't really have the funding to do it. 
But she got so in supportive and involved that she lived very modestly and took all of her excess income and donated it. And I want to acknowledge some amazing people that are here. Dr. Jan Bravo, without whom we would not have the Disclosure Project. But it's not just the funding she's provided, it's the moral support and the encouragement and the friendship. And, and so she's just become a very key person. And you know, it's sort of metaphysical and odd that literally the month that Sherry Adamek passed away, within 30 days, I have this scheduled event. Not alone anymore, with the support of a loyal team, Dr. Greer grew his witness list from a couple dozen to over 200. And see that little the little dot right there, that dot don't belong there. They said, I'm one of those, what you would call the high government officials in the FAA. I was the division chief. Uh, there was only three or four down from the Admiral. I was awarded the Air Force Guided Missile Insignia. I was the first photographic officer in the Air Force to get the, they called it the missile badge. So uh, well, I forgot who it was it called. But he says, we got a problem here. What's the problem? He says, well, it's that UFO. We weren't launching real nuclear weapons. We were launching dummy warheads. They were the exact size, shape, and dimension, and weight. And we were looking down southwest, and the missile popped up through the fog. It was just beautiful. And I hollered, there it is. And our guys on our M45 tracking mount with 180 inch lenses on it got it. We sent the film back down to, to, to Vandenberg. The Japanese uh, airline 747 was coming from the Northwest going across uh, the Alaskan uh, territory. He called and asked the controller if the controller had any traffic at his uh, altitude. His radar is picking up uh, a target. He sees this target with his, uh, with his eye, and the target, the way he described it, a huge ball with uh, lights running around it, and uh, I think he said it was like four times as big as a 747. I was called into Major, Major Mansman's office at the 1st Strategic Aerospace Division headquarters. And uh, Major Vanceman said, watch this. There was the launch from a day or two before it at, uh, at Big Sur. We watched that stage burn out, we watched the second stage burn out, we watched the third stage burn out, and it's going like this. And into the frame came something else. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, we're going like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of, the, out of space. They brought in uh, three people from the FBI, three people from the CIA, and three people from Reagan's scientific uh, study team, and I don't know who the rest of the people were. When they got done, they t actually swore all these other guys into uh, uh, that this never took place. Who said that? Who was this was uh, one of the guys from the uh, CIA. <clears throat> now I saw that. I don't give a goddamn what anybody else says about it. I saw that on film. Phil Klass can kiss my ass. He wasn't there, I was. He said this is the first time they ever had 30 minutes of radar data on a UFO. He said, you are never to speak of this again. As far as you're concerned, this never happened. So I said yes, sir, and walked out, and that was the last I talked about it for 18 years. Now, I had the original uh, video that uh, I took, and I had the uh, pilot's uh, uh, report, and I had the FAA's uh, uh, first report that was all downstairs on my, uh, my table. They didn't ask for that. So I didn't give it to him. There are things that I know about that I did in the service that I won't talk about to you now because they're top secret and I could get my ass in trouble for talking about them. If you parse what Major Mansman said, he said, you are to say this never happened. 
Well, that's not classifying it top secret, is it? And I was a part of a United States Air Force cover-up for 18 years. But who do you tell that you were involved in a UFO incident without them looking at you like you ain't wrapped too tight? What we photographed up there affected me for the rest of my life and made a huge impact on my understanding of the universe and of governmental manipulation of, of our minds. Now, with the witnesses on his side, Dr. Greer had the firepower to attack Washington again. We are not alone. That's the message a group of pilots, scientists, and former government officials want Congress to hear. 21 members of that group already have testified in Washington for what's known as the Disclosure Project. And we had all volunteers who organized that whole event and there was no paid staff. So when people look at that whole period, we didn't, have a, we didn't have an office, a secretary, and one paid staff person, but we did it. Dr. Stephen Greer heads up the Disclosure Project, a group that compiles information from people who say they've encountered extraterrestrial forms of life. Uh, 20 years ago in 1980, I was a security specialist assigned to RAF Bentwaters. Objects made incursions over our WSA, fired pencil-thin beams of light into them and adversely affected the ordnance, possibly. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. What do members plan to do with their information? They hope Congress and President Bush take notice. We are asking for the U.S. Congress and for President Bush to move towards an official inquiry and disclosure on this subject. Those that don't want to believe you will never believe you anyway, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the truth. A spokesperson for the Senate Science, Technology, and Space Committee says no congressional hearings are planned right now. Elaine Quijano, CNN Headline News. I stand before you today in my almighty God, and I tell you this. If Congress calls me in and says, will you testify in detail what you know, I stand here today prepared and ready to do just that. Governments must never lie to the people. Thank you. The number of people Dr. Greer had managed to get behind him was monumental. In a perfect world, an event of this proportion, with that amount of coverage, would have been enough to start a legitimate movement. But of course, we hardly live in a perfect world. Nine Eleven became the mother of all news stories and completely changed the game for everyone. Fear, panic, and strife were imprinted in the public consciousness to what end? Not to go after Al Qaeda, but rather to invade the sovereign nation of Iraq. Given such a drastically overt misstep on the part of a U.S. government led by an oil family, the question on some people's minds is whether or not this disaster was exploited, or worse, engineered. The Gulf of Tonkin in the Vietnam War, Chiang Kai-shek in the Korean War. False flag operations are nothing new. However, according to some, the ultimate card to play might be yet to come. How do you grow the trillion dollar military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about into a two or three trillion dollar program. You gotta have a bigger enemy out there. Von Braun's purpose in life during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about space-based weapons. First, the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. In 1977, I was at a meeting in Fairchild Industries, and in that room were a lot of charts on the walls with enemies, identified enemies, names that people had never heard of, names like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. But we were talking then about terrorists, the potential 
terrace. No one had ever talked about this before. And they continued the conversation about how they were going to antagonize these enemies. And that at some point, there was going to be a war in the Gulf. According to these theorists, after the military industrial complex had its war against terrorism, the next enemy that Dr. Von Braun identified on Earth would be third world country fanatics. But with no more enemies left, the people would soon be taught to look to space. The next enemy was asteroids. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, all of it is a lie. 99% of all the information out in the public on this subject is well-crafted disinformation designed to scare people to support the next phase in global warfare. And this kind of corruption is why the only things that are being made on this subject are things that redound to paranoia and fear in the military-industrial complex. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. I don't think we're moving forward if we trade, you know, factional and ideological war from one ethnic or religious or economic system into an interplanetary conflict, because that's A, not survivable, and B, would be even worse in terms of galvanizing the world around a military structure that has been the central organizing principle of our society for a few thousand years, actually. It is hard to concretely prove that 9-11 was a false flag attack because the people behind it are so good at covering their tracks, especially with the compliance of mainstream media. If you had trillions of dollars, you'd be pretty good at it, too. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion in transactions. According to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. I would like for you to respond to the questions that I've put to you today. I've forgotten what the second question was. How does one carve out uh, a billion unacknowledged or 10 billion unacknowledged taxpayer dollars? In many cases, at the end of the fiscal year, when there is uh, so-called leftover money, they may or may not know that money may in fact go to a special access program. There are two main types of special access programs, acknowledged and unacknowledged, or USAPs. Those programs are basically totally off the books, and they are able to uh, actually vacuum up money to be a, a self-perpetuating funding mechanism. Certain USAPs are waived and also completely managed and controlled by private contractors, so they enjoy the secrecy protections only afforded to private corporations. There is virtually no high-level government oversight for these types of USAPs. In many cases, no elected official, including even the president, have knowledge a particular USAP even exists. Between 1947 and 1949, the government passed the National Security Act and the CIA Act. These laws allowed the intelligence community to withdraw money from any agency without disclosure. Essentially, money could be stolen from any program and no elected official would ever know about it. Um, 
great view of the eye socket. Very different eye socket. From, and that's another thing that the scientists who've looked at this um, at Stanford have commented on. If you look at this creature and you look at the cranial vault, how large it is, the, the size from the eyes up is at least three times that of a human. One of the first things that Dr. Lockman uh, immediately remarked upon was the shape of the head and the skull. Uh, it was not something that he uh, is accustomed to seeing, and it was quite interesting uh, and in some ways exciting that the associated features that you would expect from a syndrome of that nature were not found. This specimen does not fall under any known, to me, class of disorders or syndromes. In many respects, the proportions of the spine and extremities are normal. The major abnormalities appear to be one, the size of the specimen, mid-face hypoplasia and underdevelopment of the jaw, and that the specimen has only 10 ribs. Humans normally have 12, rarely 11. One of the most remarkable aspects of this is when we came down to study the actual bone density. One of the features of uh, fetuses that a specialist looks at is the so-called growth plates of the epiphyseal uh, joint, say, of the knees. The, the shock, I think, uh, and the surprise was, and the, and the absolute certainty that uh, Dr. Lockman had was that this specimen is between the age of uh, six to eight years old. The shock was uh, that this specimen was clearly not fetal. How do you explain how something six inches tall survived to any length of time uh, that would uh, allow for it to survive a hundred or a thousand years ago? And what amazes me is the media, well, they're so compromised on this, they don't do any, they don't dare do anything but follow the company line on it. The company line being a series of lies. This is a document talking about the current program at the CIA. And it says that the PAO, Public Affairs Office, has relationships with reporters from every underlying major wire service, newspaper, news weekly, and television network in the nation. In many instances, we have persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or even scrap stories that could have adversely affected national security. Now, what's the purpose of this? The CIA has no mandate for anything domestic. The FBI is domestic. What the hell is this? Where are we now? We are in a bread and circus. This is a phrase used to describe the creation of public approval not through excellent public policy, but rather through diversion and distraction. No, I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. You are driving me nuts. Just free kitchen. Keep people fat, keep them happy, keep them diverted, and keep them entertained with dribble and shock and nonsense. That's unfortunately the sort of thing that has taken the place of news and information. So that what we're seeing today is a world in which perception is being managed by as little as five major media corporations who collectively control magazines, newspapers, corporate news websites, television stations, movies, documentaries. Who are these people? Who could be behind the curtain? Who could possibly be controlling us so effectively? shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. Majestic 12 is real. Notorious MJ-12, which is no longer called MJ-12. I'm trying to find out the new name. And basically, it's, it's an oversight group uh, intermingled with the National Security Council and the National Security Planning Group. They, they have full control. They have no congressional oversight whatsoever. Uh, they answer to nobody. Whatever activity is going on, to the extent that it is 
a clandestine group, a quasi-government group, a uh, quasi-private group, it is without any type, as far as I can tell, of high-level government oversight. And that is a great concern. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And there is very grave danger, for we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. It's got too much tissue on it. They actually want a piece of the bone from at least a, like a 0.5 of a millimeter in. Como medio millimetro de. We took uh, material from inside the cranium, also uh, two clippings of the anterior front ribs of this bean, and we were able to see under the dissecting microscope that in fact it did have bone marrow in them, so that meant there should be some good genetic material in there. It was really nerve-wracking. Imagine, you know, two big guys here trying to operate on this 13 centimeter long beam. But we did it. The DNA analysis uh, is being done by some of the world's best, but even the world's best need to be cross-checked, which is why I'm doing the three different facilities. So I actually ran four samples. Uh, I ran a sample of my own blood, a very small amount, uh, just 100 microliters. I ran two blanks, things that just had water in them, because that would be uh, essentially a contamination control. Uh, and then, of course, the sample itself. And really, the uh, all-important first result was uh, whether or not there was, in fact, any DNA uh, which was isolated. And the actual shock for me was when I got the amount of DNA out of this sample. It was way above uh, what I had originally expected. What you have on the left here is a so-called DNA ladder. This is a size standard. Uh, this one on the end is, in fact, uh, my uh, DNA, and it has an expected size distribution as well as some banding. And validating the original uh, measurement uh, is this analysis that basically shows that we have a nice distribution uh, for the sample's DNA. When we physicists look for alien civilizations, we don't look for little green men. We look for energy consumption. We look for type one, type two, and type three civilizations. What are we? We are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. Around the year 2100, we will become a type one civilization. And we see the beginnings of that now. What is the internet? The internet is a type one telephone system. Imagine, if you will, sitting down to your morning coffee, turning on your home computer to read the day's newspaper. Well, it's not as far-fetched as it may seem. Information has largely been controlled in a top-down way. What we're seeing now is the dissemination of discoveries coming up from the grassroots. 
and not from a top-down centralized authority which has the ability to say this isn't making it because we don't believe it's true, this is making it because it fits the mainstream. When we want to form a new team in a new country, then all we have to do is contact someone there using the internet and suddenly they're a member of the node. From this online collective seems to come a real communion. People from all over gather in groups to investigate UFOs with safety in numbers against ridicule and disinformation. What we found uh, in the past is we had a lot of anecdotal stories, but we didn't have a whole lot of data. With the advent of computers, personal computers, and the internet, we've been able to collect the data uh, and analyze it uh, through some 200 plus data points uh, to allow us to be able to compare cases and to see exactly what's happening and what the trends are. Nick Pope is our guest. He made this information public. He's also the former head of the Ministry of Defense's UFO project. So if anybody knows, we think it's you, Nick. The Ministry of Defense is in the process of declassifying and releasing its entire archive of UFO files going back decades. It's interesting and worth pointing out that while the British government is releasing their files and their documents, President Obama, who promised to do the same during the campaign, he still has not. 15 years. 15 oh years this spring. Oh my God. But I figured that, you know, after the disclosure party, we'd get this information out and we could go on with life. How do we keep battering the ram at this door? Where do we find the strength to keep going forward? When you think that you're the only person that, that has the knowledge, you become marginalized. Uh, Steve was instrumental in bringing together uh, a large group who had been involved in this subject and who for the first time realized that they were not alone uh, in trying to uh, come forward on the subject. Governments, we've discovered, have not gone far enough. So we've decided that as people using the CE5 protocols, form our own movement and do what governments have not been doing. We think of this as the people's disclosure movement. And so we feel it's important to create a, an effort that's a global effort, which this has become. My name is Mark Benz, and this is Rex, and we're in Bodega, California, and we're doing CE5. My name is Jeff Bird, and here in Winchester, Virginia, USA, we are doing CE5. My name is Peggy Brewster, and here in Middleton, United States of America, we are doing CE5. We have 1,150 teams of CE5 ambassadors, which are spread over 52 countries. My name is Andre, and here in Sweden, we are doing CE5. Und wir machen zusammen CE5 in Deutschland. And here in Burlington, Ontario. Brisbane, Australia. And From Chester, Virginia. And Hamilton, Ohio. We are doing the CE5. Konnichiwa. Moi, Daniel. Daniel, Leo Ortiz. And here in Vancouver, British Columbia. The CE5. The CE5 context, CE5. 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 We're doing CE5. And the reason I, I think that's so important is that it not only builds the knowledge base, but it also further potentiates this concept of pioneering a new pattern of peaceful contact. And that is something that uh, no other group, large group on Earth is doing. It certainly isn't being done by the State Department and, uh, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It seems to be it only takes one person to make contact, but hundreds of voices worldwide is a call that can't be missed. And likewise with innovation, the more heads in the game, the more likely we are to find a solution. There's many, many technologies uh, that people have uh, talked about, many ways to the mountaintop. We have so many modes of converting quantum vacuum energy or zero point energy. Some people think they know how to do it. Okay, fine, but if you do it theoretically, that's one thing, but then you got to do it experimentally, and that's the hard part. Those opposed to new energy technologies can tie the hands of hundreds of inventors. But how will they ever fare against tens of thousands? The output milliamperage is more than the input milliamperage. It's a clear indicator of overunity. I'm gonna ask you to look away. I love my hands, 
oscillate or vibrate magnetic fields, there's an effect in the gravity field. The and how to do that linkage is what you're trying to get at, as I Maxwell's understand Maxwell's equations are in that term right there. And what happens is if you're going to have a gravitational effect, it's going to happen over there. Uh, this channel here represents revolutions per minute. These are representing weight that we're measuring on the load cells. Full steam ahead. When we look at our data, we lost 7% of weight. If we move this thing and it loses weight, I must be generating gravity waves. Though the device maintains its shape and size uh, in terms of dimension, it is losing mass. That's a possibility. If it is losing mass, then certainly it would also be affecting time in a very localized manner. By looking at new technology, you could break through new commercial aspects to improve our society. We should be looking for a disruptive breakthrough in this technology within the next 10 years. We're on the brink of developing any number of potential propulsion systems which can take us out of the solar system. I think we're going to beat NASA to the mark. So I graduated from the UCLA School of Engineering uh, in 1976. I uh, got a flyer from the School of Engineering inviting me to a lecture by Ben Rich. Ben Rich was the director of Lockheed Skunk Works for 16 years. He oversaw a number of USAPs that were secretly managed at the Skunk Works, including, most notably, the development of the F-117 stealth fighter. Ben shared a slide set of about 40 slides of different things, starting with the U-2 spy plane, going all the way up to the uh, stealth fighter at that time, mentioning that uh, he couldn't talk about the other secret stuff. But when he ended his talk, it was he had a slide of a black disc zipping off into outer space. And he ended his, his talk with these words. We now have the technology to take E.T. home. So you have to have vision, and you have to have the guts and the courage to go out past the steps and do something of any value, and we have to go past our grasp. Um, and we asked him questions about it. You know, what did you mean when you said we have the technology to take E.T. home? Uh, ben shared three major things that I think are, are worthy of research by uh, researchers worldwide at this point in time. Uh, the first was, we've somehow figured out how to do interstellar travel already, it's known. The second point he made was that there was an error in the equations. My suspicion is it's probably Maxwell's equations for electromagnetic magnetic theory. The third thing he said was, how does ESP work? And I was really kind of startled because I didn't know what to say, but I blurted out, I don't know, all points in time and space are connected. And he looked me back in the eye and he said, that's how it works. History has taught us that to simply innovate new technology may not be enough. We have to find a way to get past the suppression. We've already now had a breakthrough just a couple months ago of the tritium battery. Finally, a company has come up with an actual commercializable unit, but it's very small. It's designed for an IC or some small circuit component. So this is a good sign because it shows the way to introduce a free energy device is to introduce a small version of it. If you have a revolutionary energy device, it has to be introduced in a way that doesn't look like it's a revolution. Yeah, 
Science is always changing. I mean, even back in the 1960s, they thought that biofeedback, for example, was impossible. But now, of course, we know that that itself is an absurd statement. We have even uh, toys on the market that allow people to you know, play with biofeedback. <laughs> These sciences have been around for decades. They have been ruthlessly kept secret because of the kleptocracy of what I call the petrofascists, the people who are hell-bent on maintaining the power of a centralized petrodollar oil gas coal system. So that does create scarcity because that is a zero-sum game. But when you take us off that system onto this new system, it's an entirely new macroeconomic order and scarcity becomes non-existent. After years of disappointments, Dr. Greer and his team are now attempting to build an energy research lab in Virginia where scientists and inventors with working prototypes will have a safe haven to build. So this is an example of how the analysis is done um, using what's called a genome browser. And it's uh, more or less a schematic representation of the chromosomes and at a very uh, high level of uh, resolution. So the sequence that we got from the mitochondria tells us with extremely high confidence that the mother was an indigenous Indian uh, from the Chilean area, and the haplotype is called B2A. Now, the other thing that immediately fell out of the analysis is that it's male. It has uh, so-called Y chromosome material. In fact, it's got a full Y chromosome. It probably died in the last century, if I were to make a guess. I can say with absolute certainty that it is not a monkey, right? It is human, or as close to human, closer to human than chimpanzees would be. But when you count up the number of mutations that we're observing, what we're seeing is more than what we would expect to be caused by simple cell division. Um, when the sequencer is creating or um, making these reads, it's doing it more or less at random. So what does the computer program do that people have written and designed? It takes every one of the little sequences and tries to match it against the known. Uh, and then anything that doesn't match, it puts in a little side file and says this is unknown. At a certain point, when enough knowns are matched, I can feel comfortable saying, ah, this is human. Right? But if I'm not careful and I don't pay attention to what's in the garbage can, right, what the computer program is throwing away, I could literally be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. What we've done is we've scaled back and we're seeing several chromosomes and pieces of chromosomes across the top, which basically leaves us with a very strange conundrum. Right? Here you've got this six inch tall, let's call it human, right, because the DNA says that so far it's human, at least the way that we're looking at it. This gene, PCNT, which is known to be associated with primordial dwarfism, we don't have any mutations here. It lived to the age of six uh, to eight. Obviously, it was breathing, it was eating, it was metabolizing, uh, and it wasn't living in an environment where there was a lot of advanced medical attention that was given to it to allow it to live to that age. It calls into question how big the thing might have been when it was born. So genetically, uh, you might explain that by saying that there's some advanced aging uh, mutation, something that caused the bone to age anomalously quickly, a uh, gene uh, that's known to be associated with progeria. Uh, that also, no changes there. So the next problem, of course, is the, the ribs and the number of ribs in the specimen. Only 10, whereas there are supposed to be 12. Uh, so there are no um, mutations which are specifically associated with that kind of phenomenon because it's uh, rarely, if ever, seen. The digits are all correct. The hands are all correct. There are problems with the face. So there's a mid-face hypoplasia, and then there's the larger skull. So again, I think in, in, in summary, there are genes associated with any one or two of the anomalies that we see in the specimen, but there is no mutation which is known to accommodate or call for all of the mutations. 
even with the things that we know could be assigned to one or more of the anomalies, we don't find them in the genetics of this specimen. That leaves open the question, what genetics is causing the anomalies that we are observing? So um, although I entered this thinking DNA was the answer, uh, it made me realize that in the context of the bigger biology questions, there are other levels of control that need to be uh, understood and answered. The non-coding RNA, epigenetics, etc., and things that we probably haven't even thought of yet. So if I just look at this is base pair 19,800,000 or so at this edge of the open region. I can go all the way over here, and now I'm at 21,000 or 22,000. So the answer is not finished, and it's not as easy as actually, frankly, I thought it was going to be at the beginning. So that's basically 2 million base pairs of DNA where nothing seems to sit. It's just like the way societies do things. They try to fit things in boxes. We have literally written a computer program that does exactly that, tries to fit it in the box. doesn't seem very efficient, so on that basis, people would call it junk. Uh, but I think we now know uh, that there's any of a number of other features of what DNA is doing in there. Uh, it is expressed, and so we need to be careful, obviously, that we don't let our uh, instincts or the programs that we write to match our instincts make the decisions for us. No matter what, uh, for me, this has been a fascinating, more than an exercise. As soon as I've collated this information into a form that other people can take advantage of and it's accepted for publication, uh, I'm just going to put it on the web. You know, I don't have the resources to study and follow down every single angle that this opens up. But, you know, maybe there is a listener out there who will be sufficiently intrigued by this to do the analyses themselves. And maybe they'll find something that I missed. Great. If additional um, samples or examples are seen of this, I'll be the first in line to want to sequence it because then... All bets are off. I want to say other things here, but I also don't want to open myself up for, you know, attack. This search may have uncovered a major finding about life in the universe and its origins. What is this being? Could it be a missing link in evolution? Could it be an entirely new species, or simply a disease we have never seen before? Or could this be an extraterrestrial being from another world? Whatever the case may be, this challenges the boundaries human scientific knowledge. Dr. Gary Nolan has set a new precedent for scientific investigation and rigor in the realm of the seemingly impossible. Now, we have now over 4,000 cases of extraterrestrial vehicles that have landed. 3,500 pilot cases, over 5,000 documents from the U.S. government, and hundreds of thousands of pages of documents from 14 countries that have opened their files since the Disclosure Project was launched 11 years ago. And yet, and yet, this isn't on CNN every night. And this is probably the most important thing going on in this planet today, and yet nobody talks about it. If we don't explore what to do, yeah. we're going to miss the boat. And that could be why Eisenhower's final message wasn't just doom and gloom. It was a charge to the people to spit out the bread, look away from the circus, and take some responsibility. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. 
the dam is in fact breaking and you're beginning to see countries all over the world uh, begin to come forward with what they know to be absolute fact. Since 2001, 24 countries have opened their UFO files to the public, including Australia, the UK, Vatican City, Germany, Russia, and Canada. The United States is not yet among them. What we have to do is pave the way for these leaders. Because if the people will lead, the leaders will follow. They'll have to. And it isn't about overthrowing the Pentagon. It's about leaving it behind. My goal when I started this was to make this so that I wasn't important at all in it, that there would be enough people that they go on without me. And that way, it doesn't matter if I drop dead. The future is here already. The technologies are here. Contact is happening. And if we come together as a people, what we're going to find is that all of us working together are going to be able to create a world that is amazing. If every single one of us told everyone we know that we're being visited by intelligent life, that the sciences are here to give us a new civilization, we're liberated from that macroeconomic slavery. So this is the destiny of humanity. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. What we've come to learn is this. We are standing at the precipice of a new age. There is power in the many, but only when they're acting as one. That's when resonance happens. Whether joining together as a responsible citizenry against the forces standing to divide us, or joining consciousness to unite with the beings who are prepared to communicate with us. In order to succeed in this endeavor called life, we must come together as one.
Oh, sure. 